so this month uh, there was actually another talk lined up but uh, he, he had to do something else uh, so fortunately there was enough time to line up another talk and I was trying to go into this uh, web assembly uh, so this was a nice excuse for me to just go into this a bit more detail uh, this will be a very light introduction. I was hoping that I could create a few examples, but I was only able to create one uh, because of work reasons. Uh, but hopefully this should give enough information so that you can just start hacking. Uh, and the rough outline is I want to talk a bit about WebAssembly and the WebAssembly with Rust, uh, which is very cool actually, uh, and maybe how to go further. Uh, most of these are actually online, but this is also after my experience a bit. And I also have other experiences with WebAssembly. It's not my first time trying to use it. So what is it? Uh, so WebAssembly started as ASM.js. It was uh, someone's side project uh, in Mozilla, again, very similar to Rust. Uh, he tried to create a subset of JavaScript functions so that it can be uh, optimized uh, performance-wise. And then it, I guess it turned out, turned into kind of a, a virtual machine. Um, and I guess, I don't know the exact history, but uh, they then was they were able to uh, compile C code into WebAssembly code. It's, it's kind of an assembly, uh, but it's, it's a bit different. Anyway, and then over the time it got popular, it, got, it, it had some notification uh so this uh, asmjs was a library was a javascript library basically uh which meant that it had all the overhead of the javascript but uh over the time it became an open standard and then it became embedded into the browsers uh so it just shed all the uh all the downside of downsides of javascript and it is running quite uh, quite fast because of it. And currently all the major browsers, and here Edge is listed, but Edge is no more different than Chrome now. Uh, so again, all the major browsers are supporting it. I'm not sure the, uh, the extent of the support, uh, but I guess the, the most extensible support is through Firefox because of Mozilla. Uh, and one cool thing about it is Rust has a dedicated user group for WebAssembly. Uh, and Mozilla is the basically, they are the biggest player that is pushing for the popularity. But it's very, it's very cool, as we will learn. So WebAssembly is neither strictly for web, even though it has web in it in inside in, in in its name, nor it's strictly assembly, so it's not assembly code. Uh, it's kind of in between. Uh, I will show you the human readable assembly code. It's kind of like Lisp uh, in terms of syntax, not in terms of the functionality. Uh, uh, and basically it's a stack machine with a linear memory and there is no garbage collection it's in progress uh, the linear memory grows in multiples of 64k and never shrinks um, and the only data types allowed currently are integers and floats with 32 and 64 bit sizes uh, so it is kind of assembly because it has a very small set of assumptions about hardware. So the rest is not his job. 
uh, and with the optimizations and correct interpreters, it executes very close to native speed. And it is also, it's not a scripting language. Uh, it is not actually uh, interpreted per se. It is compiled, uh, but again, usually there, there would be uh, some unpacking of the binary code and then running that. So it's, I don't know, it's in between, but it, uh, none of the interpreters do anything on the code itself. They just, uh, it usually depends on uh, how they communicate uh, the external code calls, etc. cetera. Uh, actually, I, I, I just don't want to go into the details of the virtual machine, but if you want to see uh, a bit more in detail, there are two very explanatory talks. One of them is from Lynn Clark. She's working in Mozilla. It's a bit uh, light, uh, but it, describes very well the concepts, et cetera. And a bit more in detail is David Beasley's uh, talk about WebAssembly. It's not about WebAssembly per se, it's why Python should use WebAssembly uh, in the, maybe it, need to, it needs to change its direction into WebAssembly. But in that talk, it basically builds a virtual machine that can run WebAssembly live coding, it's very cool. Uh, so how it works is, this is in the uh, Rust pipeline. Uh, so nothing changes in the Rust space. Uh, there is an extra bit of, like a, it's like a CPU, extra bit of uh, target to compile into. Uh, so instead of ARM or, I don't know, x86, it compiles into WebAssembly. Uh, this is, this comes out of the box, so it, there is no extra machinery. And I am saying this because I've used the, well, I played with WebAssembly before. Uh, I was trying to port a machine learning di library for audio recognition uh, into a web environment. And uh, it had to go through SWIC, C++ SWIC, uh, loads of stuff. And then in the end, there would be another library called mscripten uh, that picked up all of those and then compiled into WebAssembly, uh, which meant, I guess there's no very coherent tool chain in C, C++ world anyway. Uh, so there are billions of alternatives, but uh, this comes out of the box, like Rust compiler compiles into WebAssembly. It's very nice. And why Rust plus WebAssembly? So politically, I guess both originate from uh, Mozilla. So that's a very big motivation. And commitment wise, Rust has already built in support for WebAssembly, so they are committed to WebAssembly. And, uh, and technically, Rust don't have garbage collection and WebAssembly don't have garbage collection, so they are kind of match made in heaven. And security wise, uh, Rust memory safety is aligning very well with the uh, some of the main motivations behind WebAssembly, which is trying to create sandbox-wise, sandbox-like uh, environment. Uh, so the, the memory safety should come from the, the compiled language uh, because WebAssembly doesn't have that yet, uh, that guarantee, so Rust is quite good with that. And community-wise, Rust has a dedicated working group. So that shows that there is a community building behind it. Uh, there's a question. So what does it mean Rust C to have a built-in support? Well, what does it mean is uh, if you say compile this code into something, that something can be WebAssembly. Uh, 
I don't know if it depends on C-Lang. I don't think it is. I, I actually don't have very uh, clear picture of where it fits, but it might even skip the LLVM. I'm not sure. Uh, but what I mean by built-in support is you don't need to install a, another library. Uh, it just produces WebAssembly code out of the box. Uh, but please, uh, you can you can correct me if you know more uh, better idea. And yeah, for those reasons, as far as I know, uh, most of the, the companies who actually invested in WebAssembly in their uh, in their business are using Rust. Uh, and I will give a few examples. And what can you do? So since it is web, and I'm not sure about the web developer or the <laughs> Uh, web affinity in the group, but uh, it is everywhere. Uh, and it has a lot of uh, APIs. Maybe I can show you some, like all of these are web APIs. Some of them are experimental, some of them have been deprecated. Uh, you can do a lot of stuff and and there's a Rust crate called WebSys, and I think most of them are here. You can have access to all those web APIs. And those web APIs have direct connection to the GPU, direct connection to the sensors in, 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 in the device, a lot of stuff, uh, webcam, etc., etc. And <clears throat> on top of that, uh, I guess this is for the last five to six years. Uh, they, the JavaScript community have tried to use JavaScript for everything on the surface of the earth. And one of them is Electron. Is It's, it's basically a combination of a Chromium uh, browser and a Node.js to interact with the with the file system, with the operating system. Uh, but they are mainly for developing desktop, quote unquote, applications, uh, which are basically web, web pages that runs in a browser, but through a, through a certain um, event system, they can interact with the uh, underlying operating system as well. And kind of like that is, Cordova, it is focused on mobile development. And also, I'm not sure how, how well WebAssembly can play with the PWA, which is uh, progressive web applications, uh, which means that you can turn the web page into an application that runs on mobile. Uh, I don't have the details of PWA and I don't have the details of Cordova, but I've used Electron before. So yeah, it is ubiquitous, it's everywhere. Uh, and there are initiatives to uh, put WebAssembly outside of web actually. Uh, there's uh, another initiative from Mozilla called WASI, WebAssembly System Interface. Uh, it is basically, uh, trying to sandbox it and trying to provide an API for system interaction. It's kind of like Docker. That's why it, uh, it is enticing to Cloudflare and Fastly. Those are uh, some, uh, what, did, what they call serverless businesses. I don't know what they do, uh, but they are using WebAssembly apparently. Uh, to deploy services. I learned that Fastly is, uh, for instance, for each request, they are just spawning kind of a virtual machine, WebAssembly virtual machine to respond to that service request. Uh, so yeah, it might be another buzzword, it might go away, it might stay, but it is, it is quite strong. 
and uh, the tool chain that uh, I've used for today's talk mainly and uh, that is available in Rust community is basically you need the Rust compiler uh, that actually comes with Rust itself. Um, one extra thing is well, uh, wasn't built. Uh, it is actually making it easy to pack WebAssembly code and the packing is a bit, it might be a bit a uh, foreign concept for for a Rust uh, heavy community. And uh, you might also know that JavaScript is also compiled these days uh, because uh, there are JavaScript-like languages that browsers don't understand. So uh, they need to be converted into to JavaScript. And then from that, uh, another tool emerged called Webpack, which actually previously, it, there was a JavaScript code combiner tool uh, that was putting together all the dependent libraries uh, into one minimized JavaScript file. It is kind of like that. Uh, oh. Another comment called Red Hat also looking sandbox aspects of Basi. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, there was there's an, there's this tool called Webpack. It actually does that, uh, puts everything into one big file that can be downloaded at once. So I guess Basm build is for optimizing for those uh, environments. But it is very handy, so you don't need to type in a lot of commands. You just say wasn't built. Uh, sorry, wasn't packed. I had a typo there. It's not wasn't built. It wasn't pack built, and then it uh, handles the rest. And optional, you don't need to have this uh, cargo generator. Uh, so this is another tool for setting up your uh, initial folder structure. Etc. All the boilerplate stuff. So you just fill in the necessary fields and then generate stuff. Uh, and that generator, there is a template for that generator that makes it easier to spin up uh, a Wasm Rust Wasm project. And uh, these are the, I guess, the most important crates. Uh, I'm not going to use. Most of them, I will just show you the Wasm point gen one. Uh, so point gen is actually, uh, it is handling the communication between, it's not a runtime. Uh, it is just marking to the compiler this function bit, this function signature is going to be exposed into Wasm module. Uh, so that is handled through bind gen. Uh, for end scripting, we had something similar. In C, you had a header file, and then in the header file, you had, you say, end scripting, pull this uh, function signature, and then add to the module. Uh, bind gen is a bit more versatile than that. Uh, there's a helicopter taking off behind me. Hopefully it's noise isn't coming through. Uh, and the other one is futures. Uh, I don't know if, if, if you have, uh, if you have uh, too much experience or the kind of experience with JavaScript, it is quite optimized for asynchronous uh, communication events. Uh, even though it's a single thread uh, virtual machine, it handles those asynchronous stuff very well. And one of the thing uh, that, one of the, the APIs that uh, makes uh, outside, communi outside communication very well is promises. It's kind of, like uh, Rust features. So 
if you are waiting for some response from outside world, instead of blocking everything, you, you use this uh, API. So it's a bridge from promises to Rust features. Uh, and web sys, I just show you, showed you, uh, it has the binding structs for all the APIs that can be exposed to Rust, not uh, so that Rust can manipulate the, within the code, manipulate the <clears throat> document object model. It can use, it can communicate with the browser, etc. And uh, another library called JSIS, uh, it is basically providing uh, structs for ECMAScript objects. These can be functions, these can be object itself, uh, and the data types, etc. So yeah, demo time. If you have any questions other than before I start the demo, hopefully it won't be long because uh, try to prepare something. Uh, and I also prepared my cheating sheet. So yeah, so I'm using Windows in here. Uh, and if you go through actually, if you go through tutorials, uh, all the tool chain websites, if you are using Windows, they offer you two options. Uh, one of them is the Windows itself. Uh, in this case, it's PowerShell. Uh, and the other is uh, Windows subsystem for Linux, but I didn't have very nice experience using this uh, VASM tool set, tool chain. Uh, with Windows subsystem, but it's not tool chains problem. It was something the Microsoft just fucked up something there. And, but then I managed to get everything going in PowerShell, which is not bad. So again, uh, I I can do all of these creations, etc., cetera, with uh, that generator, but I don't want to use that. Uh, I just want to use the, close to the, to the the native stuff as much as possible. So I'm just going to say cargo. I'm going to create a library because, just move this around. Uh, it's, it should be a library uh, that should be loaded into the browser and then communicated from there. Uh, and it's created a library, so. And let's start with this. Uh, so cover up my copy. Yeah, it's just a library, standard library, etc. Uh, and here we will add some dependencies. Just copy over here. We can go over there. I'm sure you have some experiences with the cargo file anyway. I don't need to go into detail. Uh, the most important dependency is uh, bindgen, bindgen uh, obviously, and the rest should be okay. I don't even, I don't think I don't even read like rlib. Control plus plus, yes. How is it now? I think, yeah, it's cool. Thank you. And yeah, so basically this is the first thing that I will do. And for the test function, I didn't want to implement a new function in front of everyone. But yeah, this is the default stuff that comes. It's just a test for the library. And I have created this prime number finder might not be the op optimal algorithm. It's basically, uh, we are loading everything from bindgen uh, and this is important. So this is what tells bindgen to create uh, an interface for this function. 
so uh, so that this will be exposed to the JavaScript world. So it's, it's I don't know, it's quite uh, rudimentary algorithm, and then I have some tests. Uh, yeah, it's as easy as this, and this can be done for structs as well. Uh, there are examples of that. Uh, and what else? Uh, so I said f only floating point and integers are allowed for WASM, but uh, BindGen also have this uh, glue logic that can also transfer string data in and out. Uh, but it's not very efficient, so it's not uh, something that is uh, uh, advised. But yeah, there is a there is a workaround from that or around that limitation. Um, but yeah, it's very rudimentary. And then my notes, yeah. So here you have the basic structure. Uh, I will also create the web part of it, but before that, I'm going to compile this into WASM using the WASM pack. I just say WASM pack build, and it is building everything, compiling. It's just, yeah, you can see it's just running Rust compiler uh, in the background. And it is finished. So what did it do? So it's created this package folder and you could see some JavaScript files. And this is the entry point of the JavaScript, like a very crash course. So you have this package JSON is like TOML, it defines your package. Uh, and in this package you can define your dependencies, everything, but in here we don't have any dependencies. And the main file is not saying here, but uh, yeah, the module, yeah. So the main module is demo.js and it is actually just uh, importing some stuff from this VASM and there's a BG. So this is needed. Uh, I guess uh, to communicate. Okay, this is the main communication path. So, so I actually don't think this is needed, uh, but we will see that the only thing that is needed as a uh, to load the VASM code into uh, into browser is that this binary file. However, for some reason, uh, you cannot just load it. Uh, like you cannot load it when the page is loading. It has to be loaded uh, asynchronously. I don't know why that that is needed, but it is needed. So anyway, so, uh, there are some interface descriptions. This is TypeScript. So these are actually all like sugars. So uh, all of these is needed. Some of them is needed for Node. Some of them is needed for some, some library, who knows. But main important thing is this. And there's a cool tool that I installed. Yeah. So this cool tool just converted this binary file into WebAssembly text format so that we can see it. It is very human readable, not very much human understandable, but uh, it's, it's basically, it's just some function definitions. Uh, everything should go in there, so there's no runtime. So I'm guessing this big chunk is our function definition. But there are a few other stuff that Rust also puts in. I won't venture into describing any of those. Uh, 
and I don't think we need to. And one thing I wanted to show you is this uh, memory uh, part. So this memory is defined, I don't know what 17 means here, but uh, you are exporting that memory to the JavaScript world and you are exporting the prime Rust function, which we created to the JavaScript world. So these are important. And probably these are some uh, preliminary data loaded into the memory or something. Uh, but yeah, you could see there is an uh, interface definition here. And this allows a lot of uh, ease in portability, but I don't know the technical details. Again, uh, if you go through Dan Weasley's talk, you could understand like how it uses, how, how a, uh, in, uh, a VASM interpreter uses these, uh, but also there is no uh, stable application binary interface. So that's there. Uh, it's, this is shown, so it's just, I thought it was interesting. So it's uh, another side note. You can actually just write this by hand. Uh, if you go into the, the standards description, uh, it explains everything, all of these, and then you can start typing in your text file and then compile it into WebAssembly, uh, or sorry, assemble into a binary file. Uh, but I don't think you need to torture yourself. Uh, and the next bit that I'm going to do, yeah, so the web bit. So this is to show uh, this auto today. Yeah, this is the sh to show how to embed it. Sorry, into the browser. So this is just uh, using Node Package Manager to create an app, uh, a web app, quote unquote. And here it is using a another template called Vasm app. I was trying to get a way without this, but it required a lot more explaining. So. I decided to use it anyway. Uh, so what has, what we have in here. So this created a folder. This is a proper JavaScript package. Uh, here we have a bit more stuff for the dependencies. Uh, we have Webpack. Uh, we have this copy Webpack plugin, which actually, uh, allows copy some files into the package. So these are all needed to actually pack this WebAssembly file into somewhere to the final product, uh, final distributable JavaScript code. Uh, another side note, they try to create one file to rule them all as much as possible. They even, uh, pack uh, base64 encoded images into the JavaScript file so that they don't need to download it through the server. So the user should just, would be just downloading one file and then the rest should be unpacking from there. Uh, but that's another topic. So I will add a dependency here and I will just copy and paste it shamelessly because you don't need to know the details about that. It's basically, I am just coming up with a name, prime calculator. Uh, this can change uh, because, this name can change because it is loading from a local file, which is uh, one level up and then inside the package folder. So this package folder is another JavaScript package and we are loading that. So this is for Node to understand uh, or for Webpack, let's say, 
to understand uh, that it needs to look for this package in, in, in this file system. And that is done. And the next step, yeah, next step is I am going to import that in from my web app, quote unquote. And my web app is this. I will delete everything and then paste this. So basically from this prime calculator dependency, I am importing this prime rust. Uh, if everything is done right, actually, uh, so it is exporting everything from this BG file. It is exporting a prime rust function, but you can also just say uh, import this from wasm. But for that, it needs extra bit of logic. So we are kind of offloading some of the loading logic into the, this package and some of the loading logic uh, into this package. Uh, so it's a bit gnarly. Uh, it, it was more confusing in mscript and days. It is still confusing in mscript and mscript is still used. Uh, but uh, once you get some, some sort of boilerplate-ish template, you can use it everywhere. So here, to explain the JavaScript code itself, yeah, I am just calculating the 10,000th prime number. Uh, and here you can see I don't cache anything. Well, I cache the, the tested primes in, in this vector. Uh, but I don't have a lookup somewhere. So starting from two, it is looping over all the, f all the numbers and then checking the primes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so yeah. And yeah, just to measure the time, it's not exact again, but uh, the, the browsers have this performance interface. It just, uh, it measures the performance in milliseconds. So it just gives you time uh, tick and then you just call it again. And then the difference should be the amount of time it took to run this. Actually just not run, uh, load the VASM, run the VASM and then return back the, uh, the result. So, now the exciting part of compiling JavaScript. So first we install the dependencies, one of which is our uh, stuff, but most of them will come from uh, a, uh, this happens, just run it again. I blame Windows for this. Uh, anyway, yeah, so it, it installed all the dependencies that the webpack, uh, webpack has, et cetera, et cetera. You don't need to go into details. And after that, I just run a development server so that it automatically reloads every time I change the code. So development server is running in localhost 8080. Again, you don't actually need a server. You can run it inside the uh, browser, but this is for development purposes. Uh, you can just say npm build and then it will build you. I think your control C killed your server there. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. This happened to me several times. It's a very good catch, thank you. Yes, you don't see anything because everything is on the console. Yeah, you can see, uh, I will actually, plus, 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 plus. Yeah, 10,000 prime took 181 milliseconds and the result is this. Uh, I didn't have time to actually put a text box here. It would be very cool to see like this is actually running it in real time. Uh, I'm sorry for that. 
but I will conclude the demonstration by actually implementing the same thing in I I am going to dare to do this live and the only reason is actually rust is surprisingly syntactically similar to JavaScript so I will just change a few stuff here obviously it doesn't have any type and it has let though and doesn't have a vector and this if syntax is different what else yeah. and this and it even have this guy doesn't have an iterator it does but not in this form and instead of in it has off and this guy and this guy and it doesn't have an pop and this has to be returned. And I have extra thingy here. Yeah. So yeah, it's basically the same algorithm. I just wanted to see, show you that it is exactly the same logic wise. And then I will just copy this guy. And at here, so instead of Rust version, it is calling the JavaScript version. And if everything is done correctly, it's not run correctly. Prime JS. And okay. I, I was doomed to mess this up, so I will just copy and paste this. Nothing much changed, but yeah, I messed up something. Sorry about that. But you could see it is quite fast. Uh, sorry, let me just do this. And I am going to change this. So I'm, I don't want to add one more zero, maybe. Yeah. So you could see like, as we increase the hard, hardness of the problem, it is uh, taking quite a bit of time. Uh, so the, the difference becoming is becoming more apparent, but yeah. And then I think this concludes the presentation. So I don't know if you have any questions about the demo. That's very cool. Um, <clears throat> how big was the WASM file that it produced? Let me check. I am guessing 60, sorry. 14K. 14K, yeah. Wow, that is nice and small. So, I mean, WASM is taking off in a big way in like other languages, C sharp, etc. Mm -hmm. um, the trouble is, I think they have to bring in like a several megabytes worth of runtime in order to run their WASM file. Exactly. exactly. So, 14k is pretty awesome. I mean, that's yeah. like the size of a large icon. And uh, there are ways to reduce it further. So, we are using this uh, jmalloc, I guess, the the default allocator. Uh, of Rust, you can use another allocator specifically for WebAssembly called VAlloc, I guess. 
and that makes it even more smaller. Uh, and we have all the debug stuff. Uh, so there are ways to reduce it further. Let me show you. Uh, actually, yeah. So here, this guy is the best source of documentation to go further. And they have a book which is not very extensive in its, there's a tutorial here. It's kind of okay. Uh, it's just say kind of going, not going more into detail. Oh, these are the files. This is where you need to change stuff. And then let's implement this guy. Uh, and then let's change it and rest on it and be happy. But uh, in the reference section, it has better stuff. So there's more tips for reducing the uh, the the final product size. Uh, yeah, like Rust uh, is again advantages because like it doesn't have garbage collection. It doesn't have a very huge runtime. Uh, so yeah, as you said. Uh, it's it's the perfect language for development. Yeah, I'm guessing when they implement uh, garbage collection in was itself, it will be much better for the uh, languages like C sharp uh, mm -hmm. because they don't need then to bring all the garbage collection machinery with every wasm file, right? So that should yeah. improve a lot. Uh, but yeah, as you said, yeah, I mean, Rust kind of escapes that problem. Altogether, so yeah. Uh, and yeah, it's actually the same thing with uh, Docker images, which is quite cool. You also land up with a nice small single binary that works in Docker, and then you don't need to bring in a hundred megs of framework. Yeah. Yeah, like I, 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 I wish I had more time to ex explore that part. Uh, yeah, like few companies are trying to use Wasm for everything. Uh, and trying to replace Docker with Wasm. Uh, and the main reason is that like compile once and run everywhere. Uh, it's, the, it's the premise of the web assembly. Yeah, it's like the, the, the true promise behind Java, right? Yeah. That's uh, true, also, I've, yeah. I've, I've uh, heard about, I mean, way back, uh, there was some initiative of someone was building an operating system kernel that instead of running uh, native code would rather run uh, WebAssembly binaries. Mm. And the nice uh, part was that even though WebAssembly is a few percent slower than the native code, uh, it's uh, once it's compiled into native code, it's supposed to be unable to escape uh, memory, uh, so unable to write somewhere outside of its allocated memory. So you don't have to uh, sandbox it on the hardware ever level. Uh, so you mm. could effectively run it in the kernel mode. So all the callbacks wouldn't have any cost because they would be just function calls. And therefore that would be upset, offsetting the performance loss of WebAssembly and perhaps kind of even out with a native operating system performance. Uh, so that was some cool project back then. Uh, so yeah, I guess it will also we will also see it used more in some places where you need some sort of a plugin infrastructure or or, or extensibility as a way to target with any language, uh, and also will make the web or makes the web already open to any language, uh, not only JavaScript, which I think is the most amazing aspect of it. Um, yeah, you can compile in theory like Haskell or whatever without having to lose all the performance on going into Java assembly like thingy and then actually running on Java virtual machine instead of going into directly into native code in a safe way. Um, so that's, that sounds very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like I've seen some websites like code, you know, those code training websites, they, for instance, they are uh, interpreting Python, but the Python is interpreted inside the browser because there's a Python interpreter compiled into WebAssembly. Uh, 
Yeah, there are like just for demonstration purposes, there are there is a port of DOS box which runs Windows in browser, Windows 95 or something. And obviously there are ports of uh, Unreal Engine <laughs> uh, that runs like Unreal support. Well, apparently Wasm is very popular uh, with uh, crypto miners, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> there's also that. Yeah, if, if you hear anyway, the okay, fan yeah. turning, yeah, you can blame <laughs> the crypto miners. Anyway, uh, this concludes my talk. Uh, thanks for listening. I will just stop the recording.